Hey, welcome to uh, our discussion here today of shelf life. And so this, by the way, is a uh, standard F3 in the IB's food chemistry option. So we're looking at field chemistry. We are looking at F3, and that's a discussion of shelf life. So what a shelf life is, is a shelf life um, pertains to the, the quality that's expected of that food product. So it... If a product reaches the end of its shelf life, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that, that it cannot be eaten, that it has completely passed um, the point of, of being able to get energy out of that food and, and eat it. Um, it could, um, but often what it just means, what the definition of it is, is it no longer has the expected quality. So the key is it doesn't meet the expected quality, either due to flavor, or smell, texture, or appearance. And that is due to microbial spoilage. All right, so um, let's take a look here. Okay, so we have to affect, uh, discuss what causes, uh, what influences shelf life and the quality of food. Why do we go past the shelf life of a product? Most of uh, products, when they have labels on them that have dates, those are actually mathematically modeled. So they're not just made up and they pick a couple date, uh, a date a couple weeks in the future. It's based upon the concentration of what the chemical is or what chemicals are in it. And a big thing is just the microbial index, which should just be the rate of growth of the microbes that are in, in whatever substance it is, perhaps like milk, the rate of spoilage in the milk as far as how fast the bacteria is going to grow in it. And also uh, moisture content, you know, based on how permeable the packaging might be, how fast it uh, sucks up water, things like that. So let's look at the things, that, what factors actually affect um, the shelf life. And notice they're listed here. There's water content, there's chemical change, there's light, temperature, and air. And so these are the things we're going to be focusing on kind of over and over and talking about how do we minimize these. So the first one is water content. So dry foods are going to spoil faster if they take on moisture. So dry foods, think of crackers, think of cereals. These things that if you expose them to air, they suck up the water out of the air. Once they suck up the water out of the air, then, you know, they start uh, spoiling. They, they start growing microbes and not, not very good here. Also, chemical change, a change in pH. Typically, um, when bacteria breaks down food, um, acids and other waste products are created. And what those waste products taste like is that is sourness. So when milk goes bad, um, the milk decays and it actually produces carboxylic acids, and those acids taste sour, do not taste good. They've dropped down the pH. So it can be unpleasant to taste and also could be harmful to one's health if that uh, continued, right? Um, light can affect the shelf life. The way light affects the shelf life is kind of how we talked about in organic chemistry. It's the ultraviolet radiation. Because what does ultraviolet radiation do? Ooh, it makes radicals. Right, we've talked about that before. Ultraviolet light makes radicals. Those radicals can uh, react with things because they're, well, they're radical. Um, other thing that affects it is temperature. Think of this just like rate of reaction. So, um, the fa warmer a uh, product is, the faster the molecules are moving, the faster they're moving, um, the faster chemical reactions go, the faster growth of rate of microbial spoilage, growth of bacteria, all those things are going to increase with increased temperature. And finally, uh, air, access to air, uh, uh, just being exposed to air and to oxygen, because guess what oxygen does? It oxidizes things, right? Um, so that's something we have to be aware of too. So water content, um, chemical change, light, temperature, air, oxidation. Those are the things we're talking about as we go forward here. So now we're going to discuss um, how these things break down. And the term we're going to use for, for breaking down for our spoilage is rancidification. And rancidification actually is a general term talking about spoilage of fool foods. And what the definition is, just the temp chemical decomposition, mainly fats, oils, and lipids. So demo chemical decomposition of fats mainly. Now sometimes, like it says here with cheeses, this is a favored reaction. You want some rancidification, you want some microbial growth like an end-aged cheese. Not something I'm going to be really interested in, but some people are. I, I prefer not to eat things that are rancid or that have gone bad a little bit. Um, really, it's a perception of flavors, right? Um, so there might be a disagreeable smell, a taste, a texture, an appearance. And we have three types of rancidity that we're going to talk about in the, in the chemical sense. One is hydrolytic. Hydrolytic refers to water.
That's when water comes in and reacts and splits the fatty acid chains away from the glycol backbone in the triglycerides. So remember when we look back at fats at our triglycerides, there were these long chains, right? And they were connected here um, by glycerol. What the water can come in and do is it can just break these chains off, right? That is rancidification. That is a chemical decomposition of fats um, with water in there. Um, also, oxidative rancidity is associated with deg degradation by oxygen in the air. So they're actually going to oxidize due to the oxygen. Microbial it just refers to the growth of our microorganisms, like bacteria, for instance, when they come in. And they're going to do ultimately the same thing. They're going to break apart those fats and decompose those fats. So what we have, uh, we're going to compare two things, hydrolytic and oxidative rancidity in lipids in, in our fats. Um, notice what the water does. The water comes in and it's going to break apart these bonds. And when it breaks apart these bonds, look at what we get on the other side. For those of you that took higher level organic, you're going to notice that this is an alcohol, right? And on the other side is our carboxylic acid. That is the acidity that we get in the rancidity. The rancidity comes from the creation of these carboxylic acids. That's what is what lo is lowering the pH. So before, when we were doing condensation polymerization, we were basically doing the opposite reaction. We are taking a carboxylic acid and an alcohol and putting them together um, to make one of our ester groups. And these ester groups link together in this fatty acid chain and it makes a fat. Well, in this type of reaction, in a hydrolytic rancidity, it breaks it back apart. It's basically the reverse reaction. Oxidative, on the other hand, is going to be just a little bit different. Um, what's going to happen then is this is when we're going to have unsaturated fatty acids. So unsaturated fats, meaning we have that carbon-carbon double bond. And the oxygen is going to come in and oxidize across that double bond. So it's going to be oxidation of unsaturated fats via just the presence of oxygen. So things that have a lot of unsaturated fats are going to be more prone to oxidative rancidity. So oily fish, um, a, lot of, a lot of things that have oils in them, oily fats, as opposed to um, solid fats, because again, oily fats are, are unsaturated, right? We know oils, um, vegetable oils, and, and fatty oils are more likely to be unsaturated. They're likely to have those lower melting points, so they are liquids. Well, if we have oily fish, those are unsaturated fats. Those unsaturated fats are prone to oxidative rancidity. Um, the process, notice, can be catalyzed by photooxidation. What does this mean? If we have photooxidation, that again is talking about ultraviolet light coming in and producing free radicals. So if you didn't get pick up on the free radical mechanisms when we are in our organic chemistry chapter, now's the time to go back and do it. So when we have ultraviolet light shown on things, we can get those free radicals which are going to attack. So what are the ways we minimize the rate of rancidity and prolong the shelf life of food? Well, basic, basic things first, right? Low temperatures. We store things in a refrigerator or freezer. That lowers the rate of reaction. And so things, um, they can prolong their shelf life. We uh, put them, um, we store them in the dark, maybe like potatoes or, um, or in containers that are dark. Uh, a lot of times milk will be in, uh, not in a clear container, but it will be in a covered container just to uh, limit the amount of ultraviolet light so that there's less, uh, uh, less, a smaller likelihood of the ultraviolet free radicals being formed by the ultraviolet light to attack things. So low light, no temperature, low moisture. Obviously, if we want to limit um, hydrolytic rancidity, we want to limit the amount of water. So we're going to store things in sealed containers where they can't have access to air. We'll put it in Ziploc bags where we can seal them in. Um, here's one you might not be aware of, but inert gases in packaging. So sometimes when, especially meats are packaged, they'll blow in like um, uh, argon gas. And they do it for two reasons. One is to force out any auction that might be there, but the other reason is argon gas is, well, generally unreactive, and so it's not going to oxidize or rancidify the, the meat that might be in there. Also, just minimizing the amount of air that's present in general, so having, like, vacuum-sealed containers, which will limit the amount of air, and limiting the permeability in the packaging so they can't get wet and they can't have air pass through. Also, some chemicals can be added, and I'm not going to go through these 
in, in detail, but these chemicals are going to do uh, a couple different things. A lot of the acids, like the benzoic acid, um, the, even the ethanoic acid, what they're going to do is they're going to lower the pH so that microbes, bacteria can't form. Some of these other things, what they're going to do, like a lot of the sulfites, is they're going to just remove the amount of water, so they're going to help keep the moisture content low. So all of these chemicals are about, is they're about reducing um, the amount of water there, perhaps reacting with the oxygen so it doesn't react um, with the food, or lowering the pH so microbes can't grow. Now there's traditional methods to um, preserve food as well, to extend its shelf life. And probably the most, uh, the most interesting for some people is fermentation. So that is really taking the sugars that might be in food. Um, notice it could be juice, um, it could be grains. Taking those and fermenting them into alcohols. And those alcohols are just going to last longer. They're going to have a longer shelf life than the grains or the juices themselves. And so basically what we've done is we've been able to take those calories that are in the sugar or the calories, the, the amount of food energy that's in those grains and convert them into a, a compound that's just going to last a little bit longer. Another one is preserving, which is just canning. What canning does is a couple things. One, um, boiling the stuff kills... Um, kills any bacteria but that might be there. Well, not any bacteria, but most bacteria that might be there. And it also reduces the amount of moisture content within the food itself. So notice we can count a lot of different things. We're, um, and notice the final step, obviously, is sealing it with an air tight, tight jar so no, no air can get in there. So typically when, when you do canning like this, you, they are in a liquid, but you don't want to have any, um, any fresh water getting in there, you don't want to have any oxygen getting in there, so you want as, uh, as tight a seal as possible um, to, again, just reduce the two things, you know, that can make food go bad, uh, water, oxygen, and really there's multiple things you can can. I remember my, um, my grandparents used to, or my grandmother used to can uh, deer venison, so you can can meat as well. You can preserve any type of food this way. It's kind of maybe not appetizing, but again, if you're limited in the amount of calories that are available to you as a, as a society or as a, as a culture, you're going to try to take the food when it's plentiful and try to make it last. That's what's behind fermentation. That's what's behind preserving. It's not necessarily about taste. Now, some of the taste might be acquired over time, but it's not about taste. It's about preserving calories. Salting is the same thing, and really what salting does, I think salting is kind of funny, because what salting does is it makes an environment that the bacteria can't live in, because the environment, so if we have a bacteria here, well, the bacteria has water in its body, and outside of the bacteria, if it's, again, bacteria that's floating around in these fish, where they're very, very salted, well, outside of its cell wall is water, but it's water that also has a lot of salt in it, right? Well, if we know anything about biology, we know that the concentrations of these two different things are going to try to equilibrate, right? So this water will flow out, and um, this water will try to flow in, so they'll try to equilibrate, so the concentrations are equal on either side. Well, that is going to dehydrate the cell and, and ultimately kill the bacteria. And you know what? It's, it's not, I, don't, I don't really think it's very tasty, but... Obviously, this is another thing that it was done to preserve the life of the calories of the food. Um, and there's some people that acquired a taste for such things as well. I think perhaps the preserving technique that seems the most crazy that it was uh, discovered, you know, you can understand preserving in cans, like you're canning stuff, you're sealing it in, you're trying to protect it from the environment. Um, it, you know, even salting in some sense makes sense, but smoking is kind of crazy. How smoking works is it really has to do with the antioxidants, so the things that reduce oxidation that are in the wood smoke itself. So it is the wood smoke and the chemicals in the wood smoke that act as antioxidants. Um, they also lower the pH of the fats that are there so that bacteria can grow. So it's very interesting. And notice what it says. These compounds can be toxic to people as well if, if they're um, consumed in very large quantities. But the antioxidants reduce the recidification of the fats, as does the low pH, which doesn't promote uh, the bacteria growth.